I wrote the first narrative, Theophilus, about all that Jesus began to do and teach. Until the day he was taken up, after he had given orders through the Holy Spirit to the apostles whom he had chosen. After he had suffered, he also presented himself alive to them by many convincing proofs, appearing to them during days and speaking about the kingdom of God. While he was together with them, he commanded them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait for the Father's promise. This, he said, is what you heard from me. For John was baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. So when they had come together, they asked him, Lord, at this time are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? He said to them, It is not for you to know times or periods that the Father has set by his own authority. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up as they were watching, and a cloud received him out of their sight. While he was going, they were gazing into heaven, and suddenly two men in white clothes stood by them. They said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking up into heaven? This Jesus, who has been taken from you into heaven, will come in the same way that you have seen him going into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olive Grove, which is near Jerusalem a Sabbath day's journey away. When they arrived, they went to the room upstairs where they were staying, Peter, John, James, Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these were continually united in prayer, along with the women, including Mary the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. During these days Peter stood up among the brothers the number of people who were together was about, and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled that the Holy Spirit through the mouth of David spoke in advance about Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was one of our number and was allotted a share in this ministry. Now this man acquired a field with his unrighteous wages, and falling head first, he burst open in the middle, and all his insides spilled out. This became known to all the residents of Jerusalem, so that in their own language that field is called Hekeldama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, Let his dwelling become desolate, let no one live in it, and let someone else take his position. Therefore, from among the men who have accompanied us during the whole time the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day he was taken up from us from among these, it is necessary that one become a witness with us of his resurrection. So they proposed to Joseph, called Barzabas, who was also known as Justice and Matthias. Then they prayed, You, Lord, know the hearts of all, show which of these two you have chosen to take the place in this apostolic service that Judas left to go to his own place. Then they cast lots for them, and the lot fell to Matthias. So he was numbered with the apostles. When the day of Pentecost had arrived, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like that of a violent rushing wind came from heaven, and it filled the whole house where they were staying. And tongues, like flames of fire that were divided, appeared to them and rested on each one of them. Then they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in different languages, as the Spirit gave them ability for speech. There were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. When this sound occurred, the multitude came together and was confused because each one heard them speaking in his own language. And they were astounded and amazed, saying, Look, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? How is it that we hear, each of us, in our own native language? Parthians, Medes, Elamites, those who live in Mesopotamia, in Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes. Cretans and Arabs we hear them speaking in our own languages the magnificent acts of God. 
And they were all astounded and perplexed, saying to one another, What could this be? But some sneered and said, They're full of new wine. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice, and proclaimed to them, Jewish men and all you residents of Jerusalem, let this be known to you and pay attention to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only nine in the morning. On the contrary, this is what was spoken through the prophet Joel. And it will be in the last days, says God, that I will pour out my spirit on all humanity, then your sons and your daughters will prophesy, your young men will see visions, and your old men will dream dreams. I will even pour out my spirit on my male and female slaves in those days, and they will prophesy. I will display wonders in the heaven above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and a cloud of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness, and the moon to blood, before the great and remarkable day of the Lord comes. Then whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Men of Israel, listen to these words. This Jesus the Nazarene was a man pointed out to you by God with miracles, wonders, and signs that God did among you through him, just as you yourselves know. Though he was delivered up according to God's determined plan and foreknowledge, you used lawless people to nail him to a cross and kill him. God raised him up, ending the pains of death, because it was not possible for him to be held by it. For David says of him, I saw the Lord ever before me, because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart was glad, and my tongue rejoiced. Moreover my flesh will rest in hope, because you will not leave my soul in Hades, or allow your Holy One to see decay. You have revealed the paths of life to me, you will fill me with gladness in your presence. Brothers, I can confidently speak to you about the patriarch David, he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn an oath to him to seat one of his descendants on his throne. Seeing this in advance, he spoke concerning the resurrection of the Messiah, he was not left in Hades, and his flesh did not experience decay. God has resurrected this Jesus. We are all witnesses of this. Therefore, since he has been exalted to the right hand of God and has received from the Father the promised Holy Spirit, he has poured out what you both see and hear. For it was not David who ascended into the heavens, but he himself says, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand, until I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore let all the house of Israel know with certainty that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Messiah. When they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brothers, what must we do? Repent, Peter said to them, and be baptized, each of you, in the name of Jesus the Messiah for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is for you and for your children, and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call. And with many other words he testified and strongly urged them, saying, Be saved from this corrupt generation. So those who accepted his message were baptized, and that day about, people were added to them. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayers. Then fear came over everyone, and many wonders and signs were being performed through the apostles. Now all the believers were together and had everything in common. So they sold their possessions and property and distributed the proceeds to all, as anyone had a need. And every day they devoted themselves, to meeting, together in the temple complex, and broke bread from house to house. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And every day the Lord added to them those who were being saved. Now Peter and John were going up together to the temple complex at the hour of prayer at three in the afternoon. And a man who was lame from his mother's womb was carried there and placed every day at the temple gate called Beautiful, so he could beg from those entering the temple complex. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple complex, he asked for help. Peter, along with John, looked at him intently and said, Look at us. So he turned to them, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I have neither silver nor gold, but what I have, I give to you, in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene, get up and walk. 
Then, taking him by the right hand he raised him up, and at once his feet and ankles became strong. So he jumped up, stood, and started to walk, and he entered the temple complex with them walking, leaping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. And they recognized that he was the one who used to sit and beg at the beautiful gate of the temple complex. So they were filled with awe and astonishment at what had happened to him. While he was holding on to Peter and John, all the people, greatly amazed, ran toward them in what is called Solomon's Colonnade. When Peter saw this, he addressed the people, men of Israel, why are you amazed at this? Or why do you stare at us, as though by our own power or godliness we had made him walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, has glorified his servant Jesus, whom you handed over and denied in the presence of Pilate, when he had decided to release him. But you denied the Holy and Righteous One, and asked to have a murderer given to you. And you killed the source of life, whom God raised from the dead, we are witnesses of this. By faith in his name, his name has made this man strong, whom you see and know. So the faith that comes through him has given him this perfect health in front of all of you. And now, brothers, I know that you did it in ignorance, just as your leaders also did. But what God predicted through the mouth of all the prophets that his Messiah would suffer he has fulfilled in this way. Therefore repent and turn back, that your sins may be wiped out so that seasons of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And he may send Jesus, who has been appointed Messiah for you. Heaven must welcome him until the times of the restoration of all things, which God spoke about by the mouth of his holy prophets from the beginning. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. You must listen to him in everything he will say to you. And it will be that everyone who will not listen to that prophet will be completely cut off from the people. In addition, all the prophets who have spoken, from Samuel and those after him, have also announced these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your forefathers, saying to Abraham, and in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed. God raised up his servant and sent him first to you to bless you by turning each of you from your evil ways. Now as they were speaking to the people, the priests, the commander of the temple guard, and the Sadducees confronted them. Because they were provoked that they were teaching the people and proclaiming in the person of Jesus the resurrection from the dead. So they seized them and put them in custody until the next day, since it was already evening. But many of those who heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to about. The next day, their rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem. With Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John and Alexander, and all the members of the high priestly family. After they had Peter and John stand before them, they asked the question, By what power or in what name have you done this? Then Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and said to them, Rulers of the people and elders. If we are being examined today about a good deed done to a disabled man by what means he was healed. Let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene whom you crucified and whom God raised from the dead by him this man is standing here before you healthy. This, Jesus, is the stone despised by you builders, who has become the cornerstone. There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. When they observed the boldness of Peter and John and realized that they were uneducated and untrained men, they were amazed and knew that they had been with Jesus. And since they saw the man who had been healed standing with them, they had nothing to say in response. After they had ordered them to leave the Sanhedrin, they conferred among themselves, saying, What should we do with these men? For an obvious sign, evident to all who live in Jerusalem, has been done through them, and we cannot deny it. But so this does not spread any further among the people, let's threaten them against speaking to anyone in this name again. So they called for them and ordered them not to preach or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John answered them, whether it's right in the sight of God, 
for us, to listen to you rather than to God, you decide. For we are unable to stop speaking about what we have seen and heard. After threatening them further, they released them. They found no way to punish them, because the people were all giving glory to God over what had been done. For the man was over years old on whom this sign of healing had been performed. After they were released, they went to their own fellowship and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. When they heard this, they raised their voices to God unanimously and said, Master, you are the one who made the heaven, the earth, and the sea, and everything in them. You said through the Holy Spirit, by the mouth of our father David your servant, why did the Gentiles rage, and the peoples plot futile things? The kings of the earth took their stand, and the rulers assembled together against the Lord and against his Messiah. For, in fact, in this city both Herod and Pontius Pilate, with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, assembled together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, to do whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. And now, Lord, consider their threats, and grant that your slaves may speak your message with complete boldness. While you stretch out your hand for healing, signs, and wonders to be performed through the name of your holy servant Jesus. When they had prayed, the place where they were assembled was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak God's message with boldness. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and no one said that any of his possessions was his own, but instead they held everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was on all of them. For there was not a needy person among them, because all those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the proceeds of the things that were sold, and laid them at the apostles' feet. This was then distributed to each person as anyone had a need. Joseph, a Levite and a Cypriot by birth, whom the apostles named Barnabas, which is translated son of encouragement, sold a field he owned, brought the money, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But a man named Ananias, with Sapphira his wife, sold a piece of property. However, he kept back part of the proceeds with his wife's knowledge, and brought a portion of it and laid it at the apostles' feet. Then Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the proceeds from the field? Wasn't it yours while you possessed it? And after it was sold, wasn't it at your disposal? Why is it that you planned this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. When he heard these words, Ananias dropped dead, and a great fear came on all who heard. The young men got up, wrapped his body, carried him out, and buried him. There was an interval of about three hours, then his wife came in, not knowing what had happened. Tell me, Peter asked her, did you sell the field for this price? Yes, she said, for that price. Then Peter said to her, why did you agree to test the spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Instantly she dropped dead at his feet. When the young men came in, they found her dead, carried her out, and buried her beside her husband. Then great fear came on the whole church and on all who heard these things. Many signs and wonders were being done among the people through the hands of the apostles. By common consent they would all meet in Solomon's colonnade. None of the rest dared to join them, but the people praised them highly. Believers were added to the Lord in increasing numbers crowds of both men and women. As a result, they would carry the sick out into the streets and lay them on beds and pallets so that when Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. In addition, a multitude came together from the towns surrounding Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all healed. Then the high priest took action. He and all his colleagues, those who belonged to the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. So they arrested the apostles and put them in the city jail. But an angel of the Lord opened the doors of the jail during the night, brought them out, and said, 
go and stand in the temple complex, and tell the people all about this life. In obedience to this, they entered the temple complex at daybreak and began to teach. When the high priest and those who were with him arrived, they convened the Sanhedrin the full senate of the sons of Israel and sent, orders, to the jail to have them brought. But when the temple police got there, they did not find them in the jail, so they returned and reported. We found the jail securely locked, with the guards standing in front of the doors, but when we opened them, we found no one inside. As the captain of the temple police and the chief priests heard these things, they were baffled about them, as to what could come of this. Someone came and reported to them, Look! The men you put in jail are standing in the temple complex and teaching the people. Then the captain went with the temple police and brought them in without force, because they were afraid the people might stone them. When they had brought them in, they had them stand before the Sanhedrin, and the high priest asked, Didn't we strictly order you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to bring this man's blood on us. But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than men. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you had murdered by hanging him on a tree. God exalted this man to his right hand as ruler and savior, to grant repentance to Israel, and forgiveness of sins. We are witnesses of these things, and so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. When they heard this, they were enraged and wanted to kill them. A Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law who was respected by all the people, stood up in the Sanhedrin and ordered the men to be taken outside for a little while. He said to them, Men of Israel, be careful about what you're going to do to these men. Not long ago Theudas rose up, claiming to be somebody, and a group of about men rallied to him. He was killed, and all his partisans were dispersed and came to nothing. After this man, Judas the Galilean rose up in the days of the census and attracted a following. That man also perished, and all his partisans were scattered. And now, I tell you, stay away from these men and leave them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will be overthrown. But if it is of God, you will not be able to overthrow them. You may even be found fighting against God. So they were persuaded by him. After they called in the apostles and had them flogged, they ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and released them. Then they went out from the presence of the Sanhedrin, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to be dishonored on behalf of the name. Every day in the temple complex, and in various homes, they continued teaching and proclaiming the good news that the Messiah is Jesus. In those days, as the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose a complaint by the Hellenistic Jews against the Hebraic Jews that their widows were being overlooked in the daily distribution. Then the twelve summoned the whole company of the disciples and said, It would not be right for us to give up preaching about God to wait on tables. Therefore, brothers, select from among you seven men of good reputation, full of the Spirit and wisdom, whom we can appoint to this duty. But we will devote ourselves to prayer and to the preaching ministry. The proposal pleased the whole company. So they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte from Antioch. They had them stand before the apostles, who prayed and laid their hands on them. So the preaching about God flourished, the number of the disciples in Jerusalem multiplied greatly, and a large group of priests became obedient to the faith. Stephen, full of grace and power, was performing great wonders and signs among the people. Then some from what is called the Freedmen's Synagogue, composed of both Cyrenians and Alexandrians, and some from Cilicia and Asia, came forward and disputed with Stephen. But they were unable to stand up against the wisdom and the spirit by whom he spoke. Then they induced men to say, 
we heard him speaking blasphemous words against Moses and God. They stirred up the people, the elders, and the scribes, so they came up, dragged him off, and took him to the Sanhedrin. They also presented false witnesses who said, This man does not stop speaking blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we heard him say that Jesus, this Nazarene, will destroy this place and change the customs that Moses handed down to us. And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at him and saw that his face was like the face of an angel. Is this true? the high priest asked. Brothers and fathers, he said, listen, the God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he settled in Haran, and said to him, get out of your country and away from your relatives, and come to the land that I will show you. Then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and settled in Haran. And from there, after his father died, God had him moved to this land in which you now live. He didn't give him an inheritance in it, not even a foot of ground, but he promised to give it to him as a possession, and to his descendants after him, even though he was childless. God spoke in this way, his descendants would be strangers in a foreign country, and they would enslave and oppress them for years. I will judge the nation that they will serve as slaves, God said. After this, they will come out and worship me in this place. Then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. This being so, he fathered Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day, Isaac did the same with Jacob, and Jacob with the patriarchs. The patriarchs became jealous of Joseph and sold him into Egypt, but God was with him, and rescued him out of all his troubles. He gave him favor and wisdom in the sight of Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who appointed him governor over Egypt and over his whole household. Then a famine came over all of Egypt and Canaan, with great suffering, and our forefathers could find no food. When Jacob heard there was grain in Egypt, he sent our forefathers for the first time. The second time, Joseph was revealed to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. Joseph then invited his father Jacob and all his relatives, people and all. And Jacob went down to Egypt. He and our forefathers died there were carried back to Shechem, and were placed in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hammer in Shechem. As the time was drawing near to fulfill the promise that God had made to Abraham, the people flourished and multiplied in Egypt. Until a different king ruled over Egypt who did not know Joseph. He dealt deceitfully with our race and oppressed our forefathers by making them leave their infants outside so they wouldn't survive. At this time Moses was born, and he was beautiful before God. He was nursed in his father's home three months. And when he was left outside, Pharaoh's daughter adopted and raised him as her own son. So Moses was educated in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, and was powerful in his speech and actions. As he was approaching the age of, he decided to visit his brothers, the sons of Israel. When he saw one of them being mistreated, he came to his rescue and avenged the oppressed man by striking down the Egyptian. He assumed his brothers would understand that God would give them deliverance through him, but they did not understand. The next day he showed up while they were fighting and tried to reconcile them peacefully, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why are you mistreating each other? But the one who was mistreating his neighbor pushed him away, saying, Who appointed you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me? the same way you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this disclosure, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he fathered two sons. After years had passed, an angel appeared to him in the desert of Mount Sinai, in the flame of a burning bush. When Moses saw it, he was amazed at the sight. As he was approaching to look at it, the voice of the Lord came. I am the God of your forefathers the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob. So Moses began to tremble and did not dare to look. Then the Lord said to him, Take the sandals off your feet, because the place where you are standing is holy ground. I have certainly seen the oppression of my people in Egypt, I have heard their groaning and have come down to rescue them. And now, come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected when they said, Who appointed you a ruler and a judge? This one God sent as a ruler and a redeemer by means of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. 
This man led them out and performed wonders and signs in the land of Egypt, at the Red Sea, and in the desert for years. This is the Moses who said to the sons of Israel, God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your brothers. He is the one who was in the congregation in the desert together with the angel who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our forefathers. He received living oracles to give to us. Our forefathers were unwilling to obey him, but pushed him away, and in their hearts turned back to Egypt. They told Aaron, Make us gods who will go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we don't know what's become of him. They even made a calf in those days, offered sacrifice to the idol, and were celebrating what their hands had made. Then God turned away and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you bring me offerings and sacrifices for years in the desert, O house of Israel? No, you took up the tent of Moloch and the star of your god Rephan, the images that you made to worship. So I will deport you beyond Babylon. Our forefathers had the tabernacle of the testimony in the desert, just as he who spoke to Moses commanded him to make it according to the pattern he had seen. Our forefathers in turn received it and with Joshua brought it in when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers, until the days of David. He found favor in God's sight and asked that he might provide a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in sanctuaries made with hands, as the prophet says. Heaven is my throne, and earth my footstool. What sort of house will you build for me? Says the Lord, or what is my resting place? Did not my hand make all these things? You stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears. You are always resisting the Holy Spirit, as your forefathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? They even killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the Righteous One, whose betrayers and murderers you have now become. You received the law under the direction of angels and yet have not kept it. When they heard these things, they were enraged in their hearts and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, filled by the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven. He saw God's glory, with Jesus standing at the right hand of God, and he said, Look! I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. Then they screamed at the top of their voices, stopped their ears, and rushed together against him. They threw him out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses laid their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They were stoning Stephen as he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And saying this, he fell asleep. Saul agreed with put into death. On that day a severe persecution broke out against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the land of Judea and Samaria. But devout men buried Stephen and mourned deeply over him. Saul, however, was ravaging the church, and he would enter house after house, drag off men and women, and put them in prison. So those who were scattered went on their way proclaiming the message of good news. Philip went down to a city in Samaria and preached the Messiah to them. The crowds paid attention with one mind to what Philip said, as they heard and saw the signs he was performing. For unclean spirits, crying out with a loud voice, came out of many who were possessed, and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was great joy in that city. A man named Simon had previously practiced sorcery in that city and astounded the Samaritan people, while claiming to be somebody great. They all paid attention to him, from the least of them to the greatest, and they said, This man is called the great power of God. They were attentive to him because he had astounded them with his sorceries for a long time. But when they believed Philip, as he proclaimed the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, both men and women were baptized. Then even Simon himself believed. And after he was baptized, he went around constantly with Philip and was astounded as he observed the signs and great miracles that were being performed. When the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had welcomed God's message, they sent Peter and John to them. After they went down there, they prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Spirit. For he had not yet come down on any of them, they had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then Peter and John laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Holy Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power too, 
so that anyone I lay hands on may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter told him, May your silver be destroyed with you, because you thought the gift of God could be obtained with money. You have no part or share in this matter, because your heart is not right before God. Therefore repent of this wickedness of yours, and pray to the Lord that the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. For I see you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. Please pray to the Lord for me, Simon replied, so that nothing you have said may happen to me. Then, after they had testified and spoken the message of the Lord, they traveled back to Jerusalem, evangelizing many villages of the Samaritans. An angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, Get up and go south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to desert Gaza. So he got up and went. There was an Ethiopian man, a eunuch and high official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of her entire treasury. He had come to worship in Jerusalem and was sitting in his chariot on his way home, reading the prophet Isaiah aloud. The spirit told Philip, Go and join the chariot. When Philip ran up to it, he heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, Do you understand what you're reading? How can I, he said, unless someone guides me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the scripture passage he was reading was this. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb is silent before its shearer, so he does not open his mouth. In his humiliation justice was denied him. Who will describe his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. The eunuch replied to Philip, I ask you, who is the prophet saying this about himself or another person? So Philip proceeded to tell him the good news about Jesus, beginning from that scripture. As they were traveling down the road, they came to some water. The eunuch said, Look, there's water. What would keep me from being baptized? And Philip said, If you believe with all your heart you may. And he replied, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then he ordered the chariot to stop, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him any longer. But he went on his way rejoicing. Philip appeared in Azotus, and passing through, he was evangelizing all the towns until he came to Caesarea. While Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest, and requested letters from him to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, either men or women, he might bring them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he traveled and was nearing Damascus, a light from heaven suddenly flashed around him. Falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Who are you, Lord? he said. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. But get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the sound but seeing no one. Then Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were open, he could see nothing. So they took him by the hand and led him into Damascus. He was unable to see for three days, and did not eat or drink. Now in Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. And the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias. Here I am, Lord, he said. Get up and go to the street called Straight, the Lord said to him, to the house of Judas, and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, since he is praying there. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and placing his hands on him so he may regain his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard from many people about this man, how much harm he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has authority here from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to him, Go. For this man is my chosen instrument to carry my name before Gentiles, kings, and the sons of Israel. I will certainly show him how much he must suffer for my name. So Ananias left and entered the house. Then he placed his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road you were traveling, has sent me so you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. At once something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul was with the disciples in Damascus for some days. Immediately he began proclaiming Jesus in the synagogues, He is the Son of God. But all who heard him were astounded and said, Isn't this the man who, in Jerusalem, was destroying those who called on this name, and then came here for the purpose of taking them as prisoners to the chief priests? 
But Saul grew more capable, and kept confounding the Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this one is the Messiah. After many days had passed, the Jews conspired to kill him. But their plot became known to Saul. So they were watching the gates day and night intending to kill him. But his disciples took him by night and lowered him in a large basket through, an opening in, the wall. When he arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to associate with the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, since they did not believe he was a disciple. Barnabas, however, took him and brought him to the apostles and explained to them how, on the road, Saul had seen the Lord, and that he had talked to him, and how in Damascus he had spoken boldly in the name of Jesus. Saul was coming and going with them in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He conversed and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they attempted to kill him. When the brothers found out, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. So the church throughout all Judea, Galilee, and Samaria had peace, being built up and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, and it increased in numbers. As Peter was traveling from place to place, he also came down to the saints who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Aeneas, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and make your own bed, and immediately he got up. So all who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa there was a disciple named Tabitha, which is translated as Dorcas. She was always doing good works and acts of charity. In those days she became sick and died. After washing her, they placed her in a room upstairs. Since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples heard that Peter was there and sent two men to him who begged him, don't delay in coming with us. So Peter got up and went with them. When he arrived, they led him to the room upstairs. And all the widows approached him, weeping and showing him the robes and clothes that Dorcas had made while she was with them. Then Peter sent them all out of the room. He knelt down, prayed, and turning toward the body said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, saw Peter, and sat up. He gave her his hand and helped her stand up. Then he called the saints and widows and presented her alive. This became known throughout all Joppa, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed on many days in Joppa with Simon, a leather tanner. There was a man in Caesarea named Cornelius, a centurion of what was called the Italian Regiment. He was a devout man and feared God along with his whole household. He did many charitable deeds for the Jewish people and always prayed to God. At about three in the afternoon he distinctly saw in a vision an angel of God who came in and said to him, Cornelius. Looking intently at him, he became afraid and said, What is it, Lord? And he told him, Your prayers and your acts of charity have come up as a memorial offering before God. Now send men to Joppa and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He is lodging with Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had gone, he called two of his household slaves and a devout soldier, who was one of those who attended him. After explaining everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. The next day, as they were traveling and nearing the city, Peter went up to pray on the housetop at about noon. Then he became hungry and wanted to eat, but while they were preparing something he went into a visionary state. He saw heaven opened and an object coming down that resembled a large sheet being lowered to the earth by its four corners. In it were all the four-footed animals and reptiles of the earth, and the birds of the sky. Then a voice said to him, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord. Peter said, for I have never eaten anything common and unclean. Again, a second time, a voice said to him, What God has made clean, you must not call common. This happened three times, and then the object was taken up into heaven. While Peter was deeply perplexed about what the vision he had seen might mean, the men who had been sent by Cornelius, having asked directions to Simon's house, stood at the gate. They called out, asking if Simon, who 
was also named Peter, was lodging there. While Peter was thinking about the vision, the Spirit told him, Three men are here looking for you. Get up, go downstairs, and accompany them with no doubts at all, because I have sent them. Then Peter went down to the men and said, Here I am, the one you're looking for. What is the reason you're here? They said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man, who has a good reputation with the whole Jewish nation, was divinely directed by a holy angel to call you to his house and to hear a message from you. Peter then invited them in and gave them lodging. The next day he got up and set out with them, and some of the brothers from Joppa went with him. The following day he entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. When Peter entered, Cornelius met him, fell at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter helped him up and said, Stand up. I myself am also a man. While talking with him, he went in and found that many had come together there. Peter said to them, You know it's forbidden for a Jewish man to associate with or visit a foreigner. But God has shown me that I must not call any person common or unclean. That's why I came without any objection when I was sent for. So I ask, Why did you send for me? Cornelius replied, For days ago at this hour, at three in the afternoon, I was praying in my house. Just then a man in a dazzling robe stood before me and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard, and your acts of charity have been remembered in God's sight. Therefore send someone to Joppa and invite Simon here, who is also named Peter. He is lodging in Simon the Tanner's house by the sea. Therefore I immediately sent for you, and you did the right thing in coming. So we are all present before God, to hear everything you have been commanded by the Lord. Then Peter began to speak, In truth, I understand that God doesn't show favoritism. But in every nation the person who fears him and does righteousness is acceptable to him. He sent the message to the sons of Israel, proclaiming the good news of peace through Jesus Christ he is Lord of all. You know the events that took place throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and how he went about doing good and curing all who were under the tyranny of the devil, because God was with him. We ourselves are witnesses of everything he did in both the Judean country and in Jerusalem, yet they killed him by hanging him on a tree. God raised up this man on the third day and permitted him to be seen. Not by all the people, but by us, witnesses appointed beforehand by God, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people, and to solemnly testify that he is the one appointed by God to be the judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that through his name everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness of sins. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came down on all those who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astounded, because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. For they heard them speaking in other languages and declaring the greatness of God. Then Peter responded, Can anyone withhold water and prevent these from being baptized, who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to stay for a few days. The apostles and the brothers who were throughout Judea heard that the Gentiles had welcomed God's message also. When Peter went up to Jerusalem, those who stressed circumcision argued with him, saying, You visited uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began to explain to them in an orderly sequence, saying, I was in the town of Joppa praying, and I saw, in a visionary state, an object coming down that resembled a large sheet being lowered from heaven by its four corners, and it came to me. When I looked closely and considered it, 
I saw the four-footed animals of the earth, the wild beasts, the reptiles, and the birds of the sky. Then I also heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. No, Lord. I said, For nothing common or unclean has ever entered my mouth. But a voice answered from heaven a second time, What God has made clean, you must not call common. Now this happened three times, and then everything was drawn up again into heaven. At that very moment, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea arrived at the house where we were. Then the Spirit told me to go with them with no doubts at all. These six brothers accompanied me, and we went into the man's house. He reported to us how he had seen the angel standing in his house and saying, Send to Joppa, and call for Simon, who is also named Peter. He will speak words to you by which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them, just as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered the word of the Lord, how he said, John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Therefore, if God gave them the same gift that he also gave to us when we believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, how could I possibly hinder God? When they heard this they became silent. Then they glorified God, saying, So God has granted repentance resulting in life to even the Gentiles. Those who had been scattered as a result of the persecution that started because of Stephen made their way as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, speaking the message to no one except Jews. But there were some of them, Cypriot and Cyrenian men, who came to Antioch and began speaking to the Hellenists, proclaiming the good news about the Lord Jesus. The Lord's hand was with them, and a large number who believed turned to the Lord. Then the report about them reached the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent out Barnabas to travel as far as Antioch. When he arrived and saw the grace of God, he was glad, and he encouraged all of them to remain true to the Lord with a firm resolve of the heart. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith and large numbers of people were added to the Lord. Then he went to Tarsus to search for Saul. And when he found him he brought him to Antioch. For a whole year they met with the church and taught large numbers, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. In those days some prophets came down from Jerusalem to Antioch. Then one of them, named Agabus, stood up and predicted by the Spirit that there would be a severe famine throughout the Roman world. This took place during the time of Claudius. Dash, there was a famine A.D. So each of the disciples, according to his ability, determined to send relief to the brothers who lived in Judea. This they did, sending it to the elders by means of Barnabas and Saul. About that time King Herod cruelly attacked some who belonged to the church. And he killed James, John's brother, with the sword. When he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter too, during the days of unleavened bread. After the arrest, he put him in prison and assigned four squads of four soldiers each to guard him, intending to bring him out to the people after the Passover. So Peter was kept in prison, but prayer was being made earnestly to God for him by the church. On the night before Herod was to bring him out, for execution, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, while the sentries in front of the door guarded the prison. Suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared, and a light shone in the cell. Striking Peter on the side, he woke him up and said, Quick, get up. Then the chains fell off his wrists. Get dressed, the angel told him, and put on your sandals. And he did so. Wrap your cloak around you, he told him, and follow me. So he went out and followed, and he did not know that what took place through the angel was real, but thought he was seeing a vision. After they passed the first and second guard posts, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened to them by itself. They went outside and passed one street, and immediately the angel left him. Then Peter came to himself and said, 
Now I know for certain that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from Herod's grasp and from all that the Jewish people expected. When he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John Mark, where many had assembled and were praying. He knocked at the door in the gateway, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer. She recognized Peter's voice, and because of her joy she did not open the gate, but ran in and announced that Peter was standing at the gateway. You're crazy, they told her. But she kept insisting that it was true. Then they said, it's his angel. Peter, however, kept on knocking, and when they opened the door and saw him, they were astounded. Motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he explained to them how the Lord had brought him out of the prison. Report these things to James and the brothers, he said. Then he departed and went to a different place. At daylight, there was a great commotion among the soldiers as to what could have become of Peter. After Herod had searched and did not find him, he interrogated the guards and ordered their execution. Then Herod went down from Judea to Caesarea and stayed there. He had been very angry with the Tyrians and Sidonians. Together they presented themselves before him, and having won over Blastus, who was in charge of the king's bedroom, they asked for peace, because their country was supplied with food from the king's country. So on an appointed day, dressed in royal robes and seated on the throne, Herod delivered a public address to them. The populace began to shout, it's the voice of a god and not of a man. At once an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give the glory to God, and he became infected with worms and died. Then God's message flourished and multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul returned to Jerusalem after they had completed their relief mission, on which they took John Mark. In the local church at Antioch there were prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon who was called Niger, Lucius the Cyrenian, Menin, a close friend of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. As they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work that I have called them to. Then, after they had fasted, prayed, and laid hands on them, they sent them off. Being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they came down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. Arriving in Salamis, they proclaimed God's message in the Jewish synagogues. They also had John as their assistant. When they had gone through the whole island as far as Paphos, they came across a sorcerer, a Jewish false prophet named Bar-Jesus. He was with the proconsul, Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man summoned Barnabas and Saul and desired to hear God's message. But Elimas, the sorcerer, which is how his name is translated, opposed them and tried to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul also called Paul filled with the Holy Spirit, stared straight at the sorcerer, and said, You son of the devil, full of all deceit and all fraud, enemy of all righteousness. Won't you ever stop perverting the straight paths of the Lord? Now, look. The Lord's hand is against you, you are going to be blind, and will not see the sun for a time. Suddenly a mist and darkness fell on him and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul, seeing what happened, believed and was astonished at the teaching about the Lord. Paul and his companions set sail from Paphos and came to Perga in Pamphylia. John, however, left them and went back to Jerusalem. They continued their journey from Perga and reached Antioch in Pisidia. On the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down. After the reading of the Law and the Prophets, the leaders of the synagogue sent word to them, saying, Brothers, if you have any message of encouragement for the people, you can speak. Then standing up, Paul motioned with his hand and spoke, Men of Israel, and you who fear God, listen. The God of this people Israel chose our forefathers, exalted the people during their stay in the land of Egypt, and led them out of it with a mighty arm. And for about years he put up with them in the desert. Then after destroying seven nations in the land of Canaan, he gave their land to them as an inheritance. This all took about years. After this, 
he gave them judges until Samuel the prophet. Then they asked for a king, so God gave them Saul the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin, four years. After removing him, he raised up David as their king, of whom he testified, I have found David the son of Jesse, a man after my heart, who will carry out all my will. From this man's descendants, according to the promise, God brought the Savior, Jesus, to Israel. Before he came to public attention, John had previously proclaimed a baptism of repentance to all the people of Israel. Then as John was completing his life work, he said, Who do you think I am? I am not the one. But look, someone is coming after me, and I am not worthy to untie the sandals on his feet. Brothers, sons of Abraham's race, and those among you who fear God, the message of this salvation has been sent to us. For the residents of Jerusalem and their rulers, since they did not recognize him or the voices of the prophets that are read every Sabbath, have fulfilled their words by condemning him. Though they found no grounds for the death penalty, they asked Pilate to have him killed. When they had fulfilled all that had been written about him, they took him down from the tree and put him in a tomb. But God raised him from the dead. And he appeared for many days to those who came up with him from Galilee to Jerusalem, who are now his witnesses to the people. And we ourselves proclaim to you the good news of the promise that was made to our forefathers. God has fulfilled this to us their children by raising up Jesus, as it is written in the second psalm, You are my son, today I have become your father. Since he raised him from the dead, never to return to decay, he has spoken in this way, I will grant you the faithful covenant blessings made to David. Therefore he also says in another passage, You will not allow your Holy One to see decay. For David, after serving his own generation in God's plan, fell asleep, was buried with his fathers, and decayed. But the one whom God raised up did not decay. Therefore, let it be known to you, brothers, that through this man forgiveness of sins is being proclaimed to you. And everyone who believes in him is justified from everything, which you could not be justified from through the law of Moses. So beware that what is said in the prophets does not happen to you. Look, you scoffers, marvel and vanish away, because I am doing a work in your days, a work that you will never believe, even if someone were to explain it to you. As they were leaving, they begged that these matters be presented to them the following Sabbath. After the synagogue had been dismissed, many of the Jews and devout proselytes followed Paul and Barnabas, who were speaking with them and persuading them to continue in the grace of God. The following Sabbath almost the whole town assembled to hear the message of the Lord. But when the Jews saw the crowds, they were filled with jealousy and began to oppose what Paul was saying by insulting him. Then Paul and Barnabas boldly said, It was necessary that God's message be spoken to you first. But since you reject it and consider yourselves unworthy of eternal life, we now turn to the Gentiles. For this is what the Lord has commanded us, I have appointed you as a light for the Gentiles, to bring salvation to the ends of the earth. When the Gentiles heard this, they rejoiced and glorified the message of the Lord, and all who had been appointed to eternal life believed. So the message of the Lord spread through the whole region. But the Jews incited the religious women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from their district. But shaking the dust off their feet against them, they proceeded to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and the Holy Spirit. The same thing happened in Iconium. They entered the Jewish synagogue and spoke in such a way that a great number of both Jews and Greeks believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up and poisoned the minds of the Gentiles against the brothers. So they stayed there for some time and spoke boldly, in reliance on the Lord, who testified to the message of his grace by granting that signs and wonders be performed through them. But the people of the city were divided, some siding with the Jews and some with the apostles. 
when an attempt was made by both the Gentiles and Jews, with their rulers, to assault and stone them. They found out about it and fled to the Lyconian towns called Lystra and Derb, and to the surrounding countryside. And there they kept evangelizing. In Lystra a man without strength in his feet, lame from birth, and who had never walked, sat, and heard Paul speaking, after observing him closely and seeing that he had faith to be healed. Paul, said in a loud voice, Stand up straight on your feet. And he jumped up and started to walk around. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they raised their voices, saying in the Lyconian language, The gods have come down to us in the form of men. And they started to call Barnabas, Zeus, and Paul, Hermes, because he was the main speaker. Then the priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the town, brought oxen and garlands to the gates. He, with the crowds, intended to offer sacrifice. The apostles Barnabas and Paul tore their robes when they heard this and rushed into the crowd, shouting, Men! Why are you doing these things? We are men also, with the same nature as you, and we are proclaiming good news to you, that you should turn from these worthless things to the living God, who made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and everything in them. In past generations he allowed all the nations to go their own way. Although he did not leave himself without a witness, since he did good, giving you rain from heaven and fruitful seasons, and satisfying your hearts with food and happiness. Even though they said these things, they barely stopped the crowds from sacrificing to them. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium, and when they had won over the crowds and stoned Paul, they dragged him out of the city, thinking he was dead. After the disciples surrounded him, he got up and went into the town. The next day he left with Barnabas for Derb. After they had evangelized that town and made many disciples, they returned to Lystra, to Iconium, and to Antioch. Strengthening the hearts of the disciples by encouraging them to continue in the faith, and by telling them, it is necessary to pass through many troubles on our way into the kingdom of God. When they had appointed elders in every church and prayed with fasting, they committed them to the Lord in whom they had believed. Then they passed through Pisidia and came to Pamphylia. After they spoke the message in Perga, they went down to Italia. From there they sailed back to Antioch where they had been entrusted to the grace of God for the work they had completed. After they arrived and gathered the church together, they reported everything God had done with them, and that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. And they spent a considerable time with the disciples. Some men came down from Judea and began to teach the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom prescribed by Moses, you cannot be saved. But after Paul and Barnabas had engaged them in serious argument and debate, they arranged for Paul and Barnabas and some others of them to go up to the apostles and elders in Jerusalem concerning this controversy. When they had been sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, explaining in detail the conversion of the Gentiles, and they created great joy among all the brothers. When they arrived at Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church, the apostles, and the elders, and they reported all that God had done with them. But some of the believers from the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, It is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Then the apostles and the elders assembled to consider this matter. After there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you are aware that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles would hear the gospel message and believe. And God, who knows the heart, testified to them by giving the Holy Spirit, just as he also did to us. He made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. Why, then, are you now testing God by putting on the disciples' necks a yoke that neither our forefathers nor we have been able to bear? On the contrary, we believe we are saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, in the same way they are. Then the whole assembly fell silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul describing all the signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they stopped speaking, James responded, Brothers, listen to me. 
Simeon has reported how God first intervened to take from the Gentiles a people for his name. And the words of the prophets agree with this, as it is written. After these things I will return and will rebuild David's tent, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and will set it up again. So that those who are left of mankind may seek the Lord, even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does these things, which have been known for a long time. Therefore, in my judgment, we should not cause difficulties for those who turn to God from among the Gentiles. But instead we should write to them to abstain from things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from blood. For since ancient times, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, and he is read aloud in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Then the apostles and the elders, with the whole church, decided to select men from among them and to send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas, Judas, called Barzabas, and Silas, both leading men among the brothers. They wrote this letter to be delivered by them, from the apostles and the elders, your brothers, to the brothers from among the Gentiles in Antioch, Syria, and Cilicia, greetings. Because we have heard that some to whom we gave no authorization went out from us and troubled you with their words and unsettled your hearts. We have unanimously decided to select men and send them to you along with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore we have sent Judas and Silas, who will personally report the same things by word of mouth. For it was the Holy Spirit's decision and ours to put no greater burden on you than these necessary things. That you abstain from food offered to idols, from blood, from eating anything that has been strangled, and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these things, you will do well. Farewell. Then, being sent off, they went down to Antioch, and after gathering the assembly, they delivered the letter. When they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. Both Judas and Silas, who were also prophets themselves, encouraged the brothers and strengthened them with a long message. After spending some time there, they were sent back in peace by the brothers to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas, along with many others, remained in Antioch teaching and proclaiming the message of the Lord. After some time had passed, Paul said to Barnabas, Let's go back and visit the brothers in every town where we have preached the message of the Lord, and see how they're doing. Barnabas wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul did not think it appropriate to take along this man who had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not gone on with them to the work. There was such a sharp disagreement that they parted company, and Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed off to Cyprus. Then Paul chose Silas and departed, after being commended to the grace of the Lord by the brothers. He traveled through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Then he went on to Derb and Lystra, where there was a disciple named Timothy, the son of a believing Jewish woman, but his father was a Greek. The brothers at Lystra and Iconium spoke highly of him. Paul wanted Timothy to go with him, so he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, since they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they traveled through the towns, they delivered the decisions reached by the apostles and elders at Jerusalem for them to observe. So the churches were strengthened in the faith and increased in number daily. They went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia and were prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in the province of Asia. When they came to Mysia, they tried to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So, bypassing Mysia, they came down to Troas. During the night a vision appeared to Paul, a Macedonian man was standing and pleading with him, cross over to Macedonia and help us. After he had seen the vision, we immediately made efforts to set out for Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to evangelize them. Then, setting sail from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samothrace, the next day to Nepolis, and from there to Philippi, a Roman colony, which is a leading city of that district of Macedonia. 
We stayed in that city for a number of days. On the Sabbath day we went outside the city gate by the river, where we thought there was a place of prayer. We sat down and spoke to the women gathered there. A woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, who worshipped God, was listening. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was spoken by Paul. After she and her household were baptized, she urged us, If you consider me a believer in the Lord, come and stay at my house. And she persuaded us. Once, as we were on our way to prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit of prediction and made a large profit for her owners by fortune-telling. As she followed Paul and us she cried out, These men are the slaves of the Most High God, who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. And she did this for many days. But Paul was greatly aggravated, and turning to the Spirit, said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out right away. When her owners saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And bringing them before the chief magistrates, they said, These men are seriously disturbing our city. They are Jews and are promoting customs that are not legal for us as Romans to adopt or practice. Then the mob joined in the attack against them, and the chief magistrates stripped off their clothes and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had inflicted many blows on them, they threw them in jail, ordering the jailer to keep them securely guarded. Receiving such an order, he put them into the inner prison and secured their feet in the stocks. About midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was such a violent earthquake that the foundations of the jail were shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison open, he drew his sword and was going to kill himself, since he thought the prisoners had escaped. But Paul called out in a loud voice, Don't harm yourself, because all of us are here. Then the jailer called for lights, rushed in, and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he escorted them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? So they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved you and your household. Then they spoke the message of the Lord to him along with everyone in his house. He took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. Right away he and all his family were baptized. He brought them up into his house, set a meal before them, and rejoiced because he had believed God with his entire household. When daylight came, the chief magistrates sent the police to say, Release those men. The jailer reported these words to Paul, The magistrates have sent orders for you to be released. So come out now and go in peace. But Paul said to them, They beat us in public without a trial, although we are Roman citizens, and threw us in jail. And now are they going to smuggle us out secretly? Certainly not. On the contrary, let them come themselves and escort us out. Then the police reported these words to the magistrates. And they were afraid when they heard that Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. So they came and apologized to them, and escorting them out, they urged them to leave town. After leaving the jail, they came to Lydia's house where they saw and encouraged the brothers, and departed. Then they traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia and came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. As usual, Paul went to them, and on three Sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and showing that the Messiah had to suffer and rise from the dead, and saying, This is the Messiah, Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you. Then some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, including a great number of God-fearing Greeks, as well as a number of the leading women. But the Jews became jealous, and when they had brought together some scoundrels from the marketplace and formed a mob, they set the city in an uproar. Attacking Jason's house, they searched for them to bring them out to the public assembly. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too. And Jason has received them as guests. They are all acting contrary to Caesar's decrees, saying that there is another King Jesus. 
the Jews stirred up the crowd and the city officials who heard these things. So taking a security bond from Jason and the others, they released them. As soon as it was night, the brothers sent Paul and Silas off to Beroia. On arrival, they went into the synagogue of the Jews. The people here were more open-minded than those in Thessalonica, since they welcomed the message with eagerness and examined the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Consequently, many of them believed, including a number of the prominent Greek women as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica found out that God's message had been proclaimed by Paul at Beroia, they came there too, agitating and disturbing the crowds. Then the brothers immediately sent Paul away to go to the sea, but Silas and Timothy stayed there. Those who escorted Paul brought him as far as Athens, and after receiving instructions for Silas and Timothy to come to him as quickly as possible, they departed. While Paul was waiting for them in Athens, his spirit was troubled within him when he saw that the city was full of idols. So he reasoned in the synagogue with the Jews and with those who worshipped God, and in the marketplace every day with those who happened to be there. Then also, some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers argued with him. Some said, What is this pseudo-intellectual trying to say? Others replied, He seems to be a preacher of foreign deities, because he was telling the good news about Jesus and the resurrection. They took him and brought him to the Areopagus, and said, May we learn about this new teaching you're speaking of? For what you say sounds strange to us, and we want to know what these ideas mean. Now all the Athenians and the foreigners residing there spent their time on nothing else but telling or hearing something new. Then Paul stood in the middle of the Areopagus and said, Men of Athens! I see that you are extremely religious in every respect. For as I was passing through and observing the objects of your worship, I even found an altar on which was inscribed, To an unknown God therefore, what you worship in ignorance, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it he is Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in shrines made by hands. Neither is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything, since he himself gives everyone life and breath and all things. From one man he has made every nation of men to live all over the earth and has determined their appointed times and the boundaries of where they live, so that they might seek God, and perhaps they might reach out and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. G.K. Poet Being God's offspring, then, we shouldn't think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image fashioned by human art and imagination. Therefore, having overlooked the times of ignorance, God now commands all people everywhere to repent. Because he has set a day on which he is going to judge the world in righteousness by the man he has appointed. He has provided proof of this to everyone by raising him from the dead. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some began to ridicule him. But others said, We will hear you again. So Paul went out of their presence. However, some men joined him and believed, among whom were Dionysius the Areopagite, a woman named Damaris, and others with them. After this, he left from Athens and went to Corinth, where he found a Jewish man named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla because of Claudius Dash. He expelled all Jews from Rome in AD had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and being of the same occupation, stayed with them and worked, for they were tent makers by trade. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with preaching the message and solemnly testified to the Jews that the Messiah is Jesus. But when they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, Your blood is on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles.
So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshipper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed the Lord, along with his whole household, and many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed, and were baptized. Then the Lord said to Paul in a night vision, Don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you, and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you, because I have many people in this city. And he stayed there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the judge's bench. This man, they said, persuades people to worship God contrary to the law. And as Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of a crime or of moral evil, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I don't want to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the judge's bench. Then they all seized Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the judge's bench. But none of these things concerned Gallio. So Paul, having stayed on for many days, said goodbye to the brothers and sailed away to Syria. Priscilla and Aquila were with him. He shaved his head at Sencrii, because he had taken a vow. When they reached Ephesus he left them there, but he himself entered the synagogue and engaged in discussion with the Jews. And though they asked him to stay for a longer time, he declined. But said goodbye and stated, I'll come back to you again, if God wills. Then he set sail from Ephesus. On landing at Caesarea, he went up and greeted the church, and went down to Antioch. And, after, spending some time there, he set out, traveling through one place after another in the Galatian territory and Phrygia, strengthening all the disciples. A Jew named Apollos, a native Alexandrian, an eloquent man who was powerful in the scriptures, arrived in Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught the things about Jesus accurately, although he knew only John's baptism. He began to speak boldly in the synagogue. After Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him home and explained the way of God to him more accurately. When he wanted to cross over to Achaia, the brothers wrote to the disciples urging them to welcome him. After he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. For he vigorously refuted the Jews in public, demonstrating through the scriptures that Jesus is the Messiah. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul traveled through the interior regions and came to Ephesus. He found some disciples and asked them, Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? No, they told him, We haven't even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. Then with what, baptism, were you baptized? He asked them. With John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John baptized with a baptism of repentance, telling the people that they should believe in the one who would come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they began to speak with other languages and to prophesy. Now there were about men in all. Then he entered the synagogue and spoke boldly over a period of three months, engaging in discussion and trying to persuade them about the things related to the kingdom of God. But when some became hardened and would not believe, slandering the way in front of the crowd, he withdrew from them and met separately with the disciples, conducting discussions every day in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. And this went on for two years, so that all the inhabitants of the province of Asia, both Jews and Greeks, heard the word of the Lord. God was performing extraordinary miracles by Paul's hands so that even face cloths or work aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, and the diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists attempted to pronounce the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I command you by the Jesus whom Paul preaches. Seven sons of Siva, a Jewish chief priest, were doing this. The evil spirit answered them, Jesus I know, 
and Paul the first recognized but, who are you? Then the man who had the evil spirit leaped on them, overpowered them all, and prevailed against them, so that they ran out of that house naked and wounded. This became known to everyone who lived in Ephesus, both Jews and Greeks. Then fear fell on all of them, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. And many who had become believers came confessing and disclosing their practices. While many of those who had practiced magic collected their books and burned them in front of everyone. So they calculated their value, and found it to be, pieces of silver. In this way the Lord's message flourished and prevailed. When these events were over, Paul resolved in the spirit to pass through Macedonia and Achaia and go to Jerusalem. After I've been there, he said, I must see Rome as well. So after sending two of those who assisted him, Timothy and Erastus, to Macedonia, he himself stayed in the province of Asia for a while. During that time there was a major disturbance about the way. For a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. When he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, he said, Men, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. You both see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost the whole province of Asia, this man Paul has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that gods made by hand are not gods. So not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin the very one whom the whole province of Asia and the world adore. When they had heard this, they were filled with rage and began to cry out, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. So the city was filled with confusion, and they rushed all together into the amphitheater, dragging along Gaius and Aristarchus, Macedonians who were Paul's traveling companions. Though Paul wanted to go in before the people, the disciples did not let him. Even some of the provincial officials of Asia, who were his friends, sent word to him, pleading with him not to take a chance by going into the amphitheater. Meanwhile, some were shouting one thing and some another, because the assembly was in confusion, and most of them did not know why they had come together. Then some of the crowd gave Alexander advice when the Jews pushed him to the front. So motioning with his hand, Alexander wanted to make his defense to the people. But when they recognized that he was a Jew, a united cry went up from all of them for about two hours, Great is Artemis of the Ephesians. However, when the city clerk had calmed the crowd down, he said, Men of Ephesus, what man is there who doesn't know that the city of the Ephesians is the temple guardian of the great Artemis, and of the image that fell from heaven? Therefore, since these things are undeniable, you must keep calm and not do anything rash. For you have brought these men here who are not temple robbers or blasphemers of our goddess. So if Demetrius and the craftsmen who are with him have a case against anyone, the courts are in session, and there are proconsuls. Let them bring charges against one another. But if you want something else, it must be decided in a legal assembly. In fact, we run a risk of being charged with rioting for what happened today, since there is no justification that we can give as a reason for this disorderly gathering. After saying this, he dismissed the assembly. After the uproar was over, Paul sent for the disciples, encouraged them, and after saying goodbye, departed to go to Macedonia. And when he had passed through those areas and exhorted them at length, he came to Greece, and stayed three months. When he was about to set sail for Syria, a plot was devised against him by the Jews, so a decision was made to go back through Macedonia. He was accompanied by Sopater, son of Pyrrhus, from Beroea, Aristarchus and Secundus from Thessalonica, Gaius from Derb, Timothy, and Tychicus and Trophimus from Asia. These men went on ahead and waited for us in Troas. 
but we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. In five days we reached them at Troas, where we spent seven days. On the first day of the week, we assembled to break bread. Paul spoke to them, and since he was about to depart the next day, he extended his message until midnight. There were many lamps in the room upstairs where we were assembled. And a young man named Eutychus was sitting on a window sill and sank into a deep sleep as Paul kept on speaking. When he was overcome by sleep he fell down from the third story, and was picked up dead. But Paul went down, threw himself on him, embraced him, and said, Don't be alarmed, for his life is in him. After going upstairs, breaking the bread, and eating, he conversed for a considerable time until dawn. Then he left. They brought the boy home alive and were greatly comforted. Then we went on ahead to the ship and sailed for Assos, from there intending to take Paul on board. For these were his instructions, since he himself was going by land. When he met us at Assos, we took him on board and came to Mytilene. Sailing from there, the next day we arrived off Chios. The following day we crossed over to Samos, and the day after, we came to Miletus. For Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so he would not have to spend time in the province of Asia, because he was hurrying to be in Jerusalem, if possible, for the day of Pentecost. Now from Miletus, he sent to Ephesus and called for the elders of the church. And when they came to him, he said to them, You know, from the first day I set foot in Asia, how I was with you the whole time, serving the Lord with all humility, with tears, and with the trials that came to me through the plots of the Jews. And that I did not shrink back from proclaiming to you anything that was profitable, or from teaching it to you in public and from house to house. I testified to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus. And now I am on my way to Jerusalem, bound in my spirit, not knowing what I will encounter there. Except that in town after town the Holy Spirit testifies to me that chains and afflictions are waiting for me. But I count my life of no value to myself, so that I may finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus, to testify to the gospel of God's grace. And now I know that none of you, among whom I went about preaching the kingdom, will ever see my face again. Therefore I testify to you this day that I am innocent of everyone's blood. For I did not shrink back from declaring to you the whole plan of God. Be on guard for yourselves and for all the flock, among whom the Holy Spirit has appointed you as overseers, to shepherd the church of God, which he purchased with his own blood. I know that after my departure savage wolves will come in among you, not sparing the flock. And men from among yourselves will rise up with deviant doctrines to lure the disciples into following them. Therefore be on the alert, remembering that night and day for three years I did not stop warning each one of you with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the message of his grace, which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified. I have not coveted anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands have provided for my needs, and for those who were with me. In every way I have shown you that by laboring like this, it is necessary to help the weak and to keep in mind the words of the Lord Jesus, for he said, It is more blessed to give than to receive. After he said this, he knelt down and prayed with all of them. There was a great deal of weeping by everyone. And embracing Paul, they kissed him, grieving most of all over his statement that they would never see his face again. Then they escorted him to the ship. After we tore ourselves away from them and set sail, we came by a direct route to Kos, the next day to Rhodes, and from there to Patera. Finding a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, we boarded and set sail. After we sighted Cyprus, leaving it on the left, we sailed on to Syria and arrived at Tyre, because the ship was to unload its cargo there. So we found some disciples and stayed there seven days. 
they said to Paul through the Spirit not to go to Jerusalem. When our days there were over, we left to continue our journey, while all of them, with their wives and children, escorted us out of the city. After kneeling down on the beach to pray, we said goodbye to one another. Then we boarded the ship, and they returned home. When we completed our voyage from Tyre, we reached Ptolemy, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them one day. The next day we left and came to Caesarea, where we entered the house of Philip the Evangelist, who was one of the seven, and stayed with him. This man had four virgin daughters who prophesied. While we were staying there many days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. He came to us, took Paul's belt, tied his own feet and hands, and said, This is what the Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews in Jerusalem will bind the man who owns this belt and deliver him into Gentile hands. When we heard this, both we and the local people begged him not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul replied, What are you doing, weeping and breaking my heart? For I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. Since he would not be persuaded, we stopped talking and simply said, The Lord's will be done. After these days we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea also went with us and brought us to Nason, a Cypriot and an early disciple, with whom we were to stay. When we reached Jerusalem, the brothers welcomed us gladly. The following day Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one what God did among the Gentiles through his ministry. When they heard it, they glorified God and said, You see, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are who have believed, and they are all zealous for the law. But they have been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to abandon Moses, by telling them not to circumcise their children or to walk in our customs. So what is to be done? They will certainly hear that you've come. Therefore do what we tell you, we have four men who have obligated themselves with a vow. Take these men, purify yourself along with them, and pay for them to get their heads shaved. Then everyone will know that what they were told about you amounts to nothing, but that you yourself are also careful about observing the law. With regard to the Gentiles who have believed, we have written a letter containing our decision that they should keep themselves from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from what is strangled, and from sexual immorality. Then the next day, Paul took the men, having purified himself along with them, and entered the temple, announcing the completion of the purification days when the offering for each of them would be made. As the seven days were about to end, the Jews from the province of Asia saw him in the temple complex, stirred up the whole crowd, and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help! This is the man who teaches everyone everywhere against our people, our law, and this place. What's more, he also brought Greeks into the temple and has profaned this holy place. For they had previously seen Trophimus the Ephesian in the city with him, and they supposed that Paul had brought him into the temple complex. The whole city was stirred up, and the people rushed together. They seized Paul, dragged him out of the temple complex, and at once the gates were shut. As they were trying to kill him, word went up to the commander of the regiment that all Jerusalem was in chaos. Taking along soldiers and centurions, he immediately ran down to them. Seeing the commander and the soldiers, they stopped beating Paul. Then the commander came up, took him into custody, and ordered him to be bound with two chains. He asked who he was and what he had done. Some in the mob were shouting one thing and some another. Since he was not able to get reliable information because of the uproar, he ordered him to be taken into the barracks. When Paul got to the steps, he had to be carried by the soldiers because of the mob's violence. For the mass of people following and yelling, kill him. As he was about to be brought into the barracks, Paul said to the commander, Am I allowed to say something to you? He replied, Do you know Greek? Aren't you the Egyptian who raised a rebellion some time ago and led, assassins, a lat loan word from Sicca, dagger, compare, cutthroats, or dagger men? Into the desert? Paul said, I am a Jewish man from Tarsus of Cilicia, a citizen of an important city. Now I ask you, let me speak to the people. After he had given permission, Paul stood on the steps and motioned with his hand to the people. When there was a great hush, he addressed them in the Hebrew language. 
Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense before you. When they heard that he was addressing them in the Hebrew language, they became even quieter. He continued, I am a Jewish man, born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city at the feet of Gamaliel, and educated according to the strict view of our patriarchal law. Being zealous for God, just as all of you are today, I persecuted this way to the death, binding and putting both men and women in jail. As both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. Having received letters from them to the brothers, I was traveling to Damascus to bring those who were prisoners there to be punished in Jerusalem. As I was traveling near Damascus, about noon an intense light from heaven suddenly flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? I answered, Who are you, Lord? He said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. Now those who were with me saw the light, but they did not hear the voice of the one who was speaking to me. Then I said, What should I do, Lord? And the Lord told me, Get up and go into Damascus, and there you will be told about everything that is assigned for you to do. Since I couldn't see because of the brightness of that light, I was led by the hand by those who were with me, and came into Damascus. Someone named Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good reputation with all the Jews residing there, came to me, stood by me, and said, Brother Saul, regain your sight. And in that very hour I looked up and saw him. Then he said, The God of our fathers has appointed you to know his will, to see the righteous one, and to hear the sound of his voice. For you will be a witness for him to all people of what you have seen and heard. And now, why delay? Get up and be baptized, and wash away your sins by calling on his name. After I came back to Jerusalem and was praying in the temple complex, I went into a visionary state, and saw him telling me, Hurry and get out of Jerusalem quickly, because they will not accept your testimony about me. But I said, Lord, they know that in synagogue after synagogue I had those who believed in you imprisoned and beaten. And when the blood of your witness Stephen was being shed, I myself was standing by and approving, and I guarded the clothes of those who killed him. Then he said to me, Go, because I will send you far away to the Gentiles. They listened to him up to this word. Then they raised their voices, shouting, Wipe this person off the earth it's a disgrace for him to live. As they were yelling and flinging aside their robes and throwing dust into the air. The commander ordered him to be brought into the barracks, directing that he be examined with the scourge, so he could discover the reason they were shouting against him like this. As they stretched him out for the lash, Paul said to the centurion standing by, Is it legal for you to scourge a man who is a Roman citizen and is uncondemned? When the centurion heard this, he went and reported to the commander, saying, What are you going to do? For this man is a Roman citizen. The commander came and said to him, Tell me are you a Roman citizen? Yes, he said. The commander replied, I bought this citizenship for a large amount of money. But I myself was born a citizen, Paul said. Therefore, those who were about to examine him withdrew from him at once. The commander too was alarmed when he realized Paul was a Roman citizen and he had bound him. The next day, since he wanted to find out exactly why Paul was being accused by the Jews, he released him and instructed the chief priests and all the Sanhedrin to convene. Then he brought Paul down and placed him before them. Paul looked intently at the Sanhedrin and said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience until this day. But the high priest Ananias ordered those who were standing next to him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. You are sitting there judging me according to the law, and in violation of the law are you ordering me to be struck? And those standing nearby said, Do you dare revile God's high priest? I did not know, 
brothers, Paul said, that it was the high priest. For it is written, you must not speak evil of a ruler of your people. When Paul realized that one part of them were Sadducees and the other part were Pharisees, he cried out in the Sanhedrin, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. I am being judged because of the hope of the resurrection of the dead. When he said this, a dispute broke out between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say there is no resurrection, and no angel or spirit, but the Pharisees affirm them all. The shouting grew loud, and some of the scribes of the Pharisees' party got up and argued vehemently, We find nothing evil in this man. What if a spirit or an angel has spoken to him? When the dispute became violent, the commander feared that Paul might be torn apart by them and ordered the troops to go down, rescue him from them, and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Have courage. For as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must also testify in Rome. When it was day, the Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves under a curse, neither to eat nor to drink until they had killed Paul. There were more than who had formed this plot. These men went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have bound ourselves under a solemn curse that we won't eat anything until we have killed Paul. So now you, along with the Sanhedrin, make a request to the commander that he bring him down to you as if you were going to investigate his case more thoroughly. However, before he gets near, we are ready to kill him. But the son of Paul's sister, hearing about their ambush, came and entered the barracks and reported it to Paul. Then Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the commander, because he has something to report to him. So he took him, brought him to the commander, and said, The prisoner Paul called me and asked me to bring this young man to you, because he has something to tell you. Then the commander took him by the hand, led him aside, and inquired privately, What is it you have to report to me? The Jews, he said, have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the Sanhedrin tomorrow, as though they are going to hold a somewhat more careful inquiry about him. Don't let them persuade you, because there are more than of them arranging to ambush him, men who have bound themselves under a curse not to eat or drink until they kill him. Now they are ready, waiting for a commitment from you. So the commander dismissed the young man and instructed him, Don't tell anyone that you have informed me about this. He summoned two of his centurions and said, Get soldiers ready with cavalry and spearmen to go to Caesarea at nine tonight. Also provide mounts so they can put Paul on them and bring him safely to Felix the governor. He wrote a letter of this kind. Claudius Lysias, to the most excellent governor Felix, greetings. When this man had been seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them, I arrived with my troops and rescued him because I learned that he is a Roman citizen. Wanting to know the charge for which they were accusing him, I brought him down before their Sanhedrin. I found out that the accusations were about disputed matters in their law, and that there was no charge that merited death or chains. When I was informed that there was a plot against the man, I sent him to you right away. I also ordered his accusers to state their case against him in your presence. Therefore, during the night, the soldiers took Paul and brought him to Antipatris as they were ordered. The next day, they returned to the barracks, allowing the cavalry to go on with him. When these men entered Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they also presented Paul to him. After he read it, he asked what province he was from. So when he learned he was from Cilicia, he said, I will give you a hearing whenever your accusers get here too. And he ordered that he be kept under guard in Herod's palace. After five days Ananias the high priest came down with some elders and a lawyer named Tertullus. These men presented their case against Paul to the governor. When he was called in, Tertullus began to accuse him and said, Since we enjoy great peace because of you, and reforms are taking place for the benefit of this nation by your foresight. We gratefully receive them always and in all places, most excellent Felix, with all thankfulness. However, so that I will not burden you any further, I beg you in your graciousness to give us a brief hearing. For we have found this man to be a plague, an agitator among all the Jews throughout the Roman world, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. He even tried to desecrate the temple, so we apprehended him, and wanted to judge him according to our law. 
But Lysias the commander came and took him from our hands, commanding his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself you will be able to discern all these things of which we accuse him. The Jews also joined in the attack, alleging that these things were so. When the governor motioned to him to speak, Paul replied, Because I know you have been a judge of this nation for many years, I am glad to offer my defense in what concerns me. You are able to determine that it is no more than days since I went up to worship in Jerusalem. And they didn't find me arguing with anyone or causing a disturbance among the crowd, either in the temple complex or in the synagogues, or anywhere in the city. Neither can they provide evidence to you of what they now bring against me. But I confess this to you, that according to the way, which they call a sect, so I worship my father's God, believing all the things that are written in the law and in the prophets. And I have a hope in God, which these men themselves also accept, that there is going to be a resurrection, both of the righteous and the unrighteous. I always do my best to have a clear conscience toward God and men. After many years, I came to bring charitable gifts and offerings to my nation. And while I was doing this, some Jews from the province of Asia found me richly purified in the temple, without a crowd and without any uproar. It is they who ought to be here before you to bring charges, if they have anything against me. Either let these men here state what wrongdoing they found in me when I stood before the Sanhedrin. Or about this one statement I cried out while standing among them, Today I am being judged before you concerning the resurrection of the dead. Since Felix was accurately informed about the way, he adjourned the hearing, saying, When Lysias the commander comes down, I will decide your case. He ordered that the centurion keep Paul under guard, though he could have some freedom, and that he should not prevent any of his friends from serving him. After some days, when Felix came with his wife Drusilla, who was Jewish, he sent for Paul and listened to him on the subject of faith in Christ Jesus. Now as he spoke about righteousness, self-control, and the judgment to come, Felix became afraid and replied, Leave for now, but when I find time I'll call for you. At the same time he was also hoping that money would be given to him by Paul. For this reason he sent for him quite often and conversed with him. After two years had passed, Felix received a successor, Porcius Festus, and because he wished to do a favor for the Jews, Felix left Paul in prison. Three days after Festus arrived in the province, he went up to Jerusalem from Caesarea. Then the chief priests and the leaders of the Jews presented their case against Paul to him, and they appealed, asking him to do them a favor against Paul, that he might summon him to Jerusalem. They were preparing an ambush along the road to kill him. However, Festus answered that Paul should be kept at Caesarea, and that he himself was about to go there shortly. Therefore, he said, Let the men of authority among you go down with me and accuse him, if there is any wrong in this man. When he had spent not more than eight or days among them, he went down to Caesarea. The next day, seated at the judge's bench, he commanded Paul to be brought in. When he arrived, the Jews who had come down from Jerusalem stood around him and brought many serious charges that they were not able to prove. While Paul made the defense that, neither against the Jewish law, nor against the temple, nor against Caesar have I sinned at all. Then Festus, wanting to do a favor for the Jews, replied to Paul, Are you willing to go up to Jerusalem, there to be tried before me on these charges? But Paul said, I am standing at Caesar's tribunal, where I ought to be tried. I have done no wrong to the Jews, as even you can see very well. If then I am doing wrong, or have done anything deserving of death, I do not refuse to die, but if there is nothing to what these men accuse me of, no one can give me up to them. I appeal to Caesar. After Festus conferred with his counsel, he replied, You have appealed to Caesar, to Caesar you will go. After some days had passed, King Agrippa, 
and Bernice arrived in Caesarea and paid a courtesy call on Festus. Since they stayed there many days, Festus presented Paul's case to the king, saying, There's a man who was left as a prisoner by Felix. When I was in Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews presented their case and asked for a judgment against him. I answered them that it's not the Romans' custom to give any man up before the accused confronts the accuser's face to face and has an opportunity to give a defense concerning the charge. Therefore, when they had assembled here, I did not delay. The next day I sat at the judge's bench and ordered the man to be brought in. Concerning him, the accusers stood up and brought no charge of the sort I was expecting. Instead, they had some disagreements with him about their own religion and about a certain Jesus, a dead man whom Paul claimed to be alive. Since I was at a loss in a dispute over such things, I asked him if he wished to go to Jerusalem and be tried there concerning these matters. But when Paul appealed to be held for trial by the emperor, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I could send him to Caesar. Then Agrippa said to Festus, I would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you will hear him. So the next day, Agrippa and Bernice came with great pomp and entered the auditorium with the commanders and prominent men of the city. When Festus gave the command, Paul was brought in. Then Festus said, King Agrippa and all men present with us, you see this man about whom the whole Jewish community has appealed to me, both in Jerusalem and here, shouting that he should not live any longer. Now I realized that he had not done anything deserving of death, but when he himself appealed to the emperor, I decided to send him. I have nothing definite to write to the emperor about him. Therefore, I have brought him before all of you, and especially before you, King Agrippa, so that after this examination is over, I may have something to write. For it seems unreasonable to me to send a prisoner and not to indicate the charges against him. Agrippa said to Paul, It is permitted for you to speak for yourself. Then Paul stretched out his hand and began his defense. I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that today I am going to make a defense before you about everything I am accused of by the Jews especially since you are an expert in all the Jewish customs and controversies. Therefore I beg you to listen to me patiently. All the Jews know my way of life from my youth, which was spent from the beginning among my own nation and in Jerusalem. They had previously known me for quite some time, if they were willing to testify, that according to the strictest party of our religion I lived as a Pharisee. And now I stand on trial for the hope of the promise made by God to our fathers. The promise, our tribes hope to attain as they earnestly serve him night and day. Because of this hope I am being accused by the Jews, O King. Why is it considered incredible by any of you that God raises the dead? In fact, I myself supposed it was necessary to do many things in opposition to the name of Jesus the Nazarene. This I actually did in Jerusalem, and I locked up many of the saints in prison, since I had received authority for that from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. In all the synagogues I often tried to make them blaspheme by punishing them. Being greatly enraged at them, I even pursued them to foreign cities. Under these circumstances I was traveling to Damascus with authority and a commission from the chief priests. At midday, while on the road, O King, I saw a light from heaven brighter than the sun, shining around me and those traveling with me. When we had all fallen to the ground, I heard a voice speaking to me in the Hebrew language, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It is hard for you to kick against the goads. But I said, Who are you, Lord? And the Lord replied, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But get up and stand on your feet. For I have appeared to you for this purpose, to appoint you as a servant and a witness of things you have seen, and of things in which I will appear to you. I will rescue you from the people and from the Gentiles, to whom I now send you. To open their eyes that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. Therefore, King Agrippa, I was not disobedient to the heavenly vision. Instead, 
I preach to those in Damascus first, and to those in Jerusalem and in all the region of Judea, and to the Gentiles, that they should repent and turn to God, and do works worthy of repentance. For this reason the Jews seized me in the temple complex and were trying to kill me. Since I have obtained help that comes from God, to this day I stand and testify to both small and great, saying nothing else than what the prophets and Moses said would take place. That the Messiah must suffer, and that as the first to rise from the dead, he would proclaim light to our people and to the Gentiles. As he was making his defense this way, Festus exclaimed in a loud voice, You're out of your mind, Paul. Too much study is driving you mad. But Paul replied, I'm not out of my mind, most excellent Festus. On the contrary, I'm speaking words of truth and good judgment. For the king knows about these matters. It is to him that I am actually speaking boldly. For I'm not convinced that any of these things escapes his notice, since this was not done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know you believe. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Are you going to persuade me to become a Christian so easily? I wish before God, replied Paul, that whether easily or with difficulty, not only you but all who listen to me today might become as I am except for these chains. So the king, the governor, Bernice, and those sitting with them got up. And when they had left they talked with each other and said, This man is doing nothing that deserves death or chains. Then Agrippa said to Festus, This man could have been released if he had not appealed to Caesar. When it was decided that we were to sail to Italy, they handed over Paul and some other prisoners to a centurion named Julius, of the Imperial Regiment. So when we boarded a ship of Adramidium, we put to sea, intending to sail to ports along the coast of the province of Asia. Aristarchus, a Macedonian of Thessalonica, was with us. The next day we stayed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and allowed him to go to his friends to receive their care. When we had put out to sea from there, we sailed along the northern coast of Cyprus because the winds were against us. After sailing through the open sea off Cilicia and Pamphylia, we reached Myra in Lycia. There the centurion found an Alexandrian ship sailing for Italy and put us on board. Sailing slowly for many days, we came with difficulty as far as Nidus. But since the wind did not allow us to approach it, we sailed along the south side of Crete off Samini. With yet more difficulty we sailed along the coast, and came to a place called Fair Havens near the city of Lacia. By now much time had passed, and the voyage was already dangerous. Since the fast was already over, Paul gave his advice, and told them, Men, I can see that this voyage is headed toward damage and heavy loss, not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. But the centurion paid attention to the captain and the owner of the ship rather than to what Paul said. Since the harbor was unsuitable to winter in, the majority decided to set sail from there, hoping somehow to reach Phoenix, a harbor on Crete open to the southwest and northwest, and to winter there. When a gentle south wind sprang up, they thought they had achieved their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along the shore of Crete. But not long afterwards, a fierce wind, called the Northeaster, rushed down from the island. Since the ship was caught and was unable to head into the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. After running under the shelter of a little island called Cauda, we were barely able to get control of the skiff. After hoisting it up, they used ropes and tackle and girded the ship. Then, fearing they would run aground on the Sirtis, they lowered the drift anchor, and in this way they were driven along. Because we were being severely battered by the storm, they began to jettison the cargo the next day. On the third day, they threw the ship's gear overboard with their own hands. For many days neither sun nor stars appeared, and the severe storm keep raging, finally all hope that we would be saved was disappearing. Since many were going without food, Paul stood up among them and said, You men should have followed my advice not to sail from Crete and sustain this damage and loss. 
Now I urge you to take courage, because there will be no loss of any of your lives, but only of the ship. For this night an angel of the god I belong to and serve stood by me, saying, Don't be afraid, Paul. You must stand before Caesar. And, look, God has graciously given you all those who are sailing with you. Therefore, take courage, men, because I believe God that it will be just the way it was told to me. However, we must run aground on a certain island. When the fourteenth night came, we were drifting in the Adriatic Sea, and in the middle of the night the sailors thought they were approaching land. They took a sound and found it to be feet deep, when they had sailed a little farther and sounded again, they found it to be feet deep. Then, fearing we might run aground in some rocky place, they dropped four anchors from the stern and prayed for daylight to come. Some sailors tried to escape from the ship, they had let down the skiff into the sea, pretending that they were going to put out anchors from the bow. Paul said to the centurion and the soldiers, Unless these men stay in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut the ropes holding the skiff and let it drop away. When it was just about daylight, Paul urged them all to take food, saying, Today is the fourteenth day that you have been waiting and going without food, having eaten nothing. Therefore I urge you to take some food. For this has to do with your survival, since not a hair will be lost from the head of any of you. After he said these things and had taken some bread, he gave thanks to God in the presence of them all, and when he had broken it, he began to eat. They all became encouraged and took food themselves. In all there were of us on the ship. And having eaten enough food, they began to lighten the ship by throwing the grain overboard into the sea. When daylight came, they did not recognize the land, but sighted a bay with a beach. They planned to run the ship ashore if they could. After casting off the anchors, they left them in the sea, at the same time loosening the ropes that held the rudders. Then they hoisted the foresail to the wind and headed for the beach. But they struck a sandbar and ran the ship aground. The bow jammed fast and remained immovable, but the stern began to break up with the pounding of the waves. The soldiers' plan was to kill the prisoners so that no one could swim off and escape. But the centurion kept them from carrying out their plan because he wanted to save Paul, so he ordered those who could swim to jump overboard first and get to land. The rest were to follow, some on planks and some on debris from the ship. In this way, all got safely to land. Safely ashore, we then learned that the island was called Malta. The local people showed us extraordinary kindness, for they lit a fire and took us all in, since rain was falling and it was cold. As Paul gathered a bundle of brushwood and put it on the fire, a viper came out because of the heat and fastened itself to his hand. When the local people saw the creature hanging from his hand, they said to one another, This man is probably a murderer, and though he has escaped the sea, justice does not allow him to live. However, he shook the creature off into the fire and suffered no harm. They expected that he would swell up or suddenly drop dead. But after they waited a long time and saw nothing unusual happen to him, they changed their minds and said he was a god. Now in the area around that place was an estate belonging to the leading man of the island, named Publius, who welcomed us and entertained us hospitably for three days. It happened that Publius' father was in bed suffering from fever and dysentery. Paul went to him, and praying and laying his hands on him, he healed him. After this, the rest of those on the island who had diseases also came and were cured. So they heaped many honors on us, and when we sailed, they gave us what we needed. After three months we set sail in an Alexandrian ship that had wintered at the island, with the twin brothers as its figurehead. Putting in at Syracuse, we stayed three days. From there, after making a circuit along the coast, we reached Regium. After one day a south wind sprang up, and the second day we came to Puteoli. There we found believers and were invited to stay with them for seven days. And so we came to Rome. 
Now the believers from there had heard the news about us and had come to meet us as far as the Forum of Appius and the Three Taverns. When Paul saw them, he thanked God and took courage. And when we entered Rome, Paul was permitted to stay by himself with the soldier who guarded him. After three days he called together the leaders of the Jews. And when they had gathered he said to them, Brothers, although I have done nothing against our people or the customs of our forefathers, I was delivered as a prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. Who, after examining me, wanted to release me, since I had not committed a capital offense. Because the Jews objected, I was compelled to appeal to Caesar, it was not as though I had any accusation against my nation. So, for this reason I've asked to see you and speak to you. In fact, it is for the hope of Israel that I'm wearing this chain. And they said to him, We haven't received any letters about you from Judea, none of the brothers has come and reported or spoken anything evil about you. But we consider it suitable to hear from you what you think. Concerning this sect, we are aware that it is spoken against everywhere. After arranging a day with him, many came to him at his lodging. From dawn to dusk he expounded and witnessed the kingdom of God. He persuaded them concerning Jesus from both the law of Moses and the prophets. Some were persuaded by what he said, but others did not believe. Disagreeing among themselves, they began to leave after Paul made one statement, the Holy Spirit correctly spoke through the prophet Isaiah to your forefathers. When he said, Go to these people and say, You will listen and listen, yet never understand, and you will look and look, yet never perceive. For this people's heart has grown callous, their ears are hard of hearing, and they have shut their eyes, otherwise they might see with their eyes and hear with their ears, understand with their heart, and be converted and I would heal them. Therefore, let it be known to you that this saving work of God has been sent to the Gentiles, they will listen. After he said these things, the Jews departed, while engaging in a prolonged debate among themselves. Then he stayed two whole years in his own rented house and he welcomed all who visited him, proclaiming the kingdom of God and teaching the things concerning the Lord Jesus Christ with full boldness and without hindrance.